Thank you. I think I need to turn something on here. I clicked it off at the back. It's on now. Actually, I turned it off back there. I got it on now. There's two or three or four of them hanging on here, so I want to make sure they're all in sync. I don't know whether that's some subtle form of uh, shock method planned on me or what, but uh, I hope the sound works. Are you able to hear me well? No problem. Well, it's an honor to be in Washington. Actually, uh, we've been here now for the last three days. My wife and my son and I have been here. My wife just headed back this morning um, because she's on her way with my daughter to India soon, uh, next week. So she just had to go there and get uh, all the things in order. We have a couple of dogs and uh, they wreak havoc. At least one of them does, not ours, but my son's dogs very misbehave, uh, misbehaves all the time. Uh, he's standing out there, so I'm just trying to get needle him a little bit on that. So a little puppy. Margie went back home and we've had a wonderful two days in Washington. The opportunity yesterday to have a time of prayer in the White House and then uh, to speak at the Pentagon and then at Cannon House uh, prior to that one or two other sessions and uh, tonight and tomorrow morning here, Sunday morning at two church services and uh, then actually I head back to Atlanta for major back surgery. Unfortunately that's awaiting me and uh, I'll be off the road for about a minimum of two months after that. Hopefully all will be well and I'll hit the road again. Actually about two months ago if you talked to me the news was not good at all. I had surgery in 2002 to fuse uh, triple fusion L34, L45, S1 and um, just found out a couple months ago that that fusion had not taken and that's why all the symptoms I was in Thailand when the doctor phoned me to alert me to that and I said that's great to five years to find I was not taken I don't know how I've been walking around but uh, something had taken I guess and when I came back they said it's bad news we're gonna have to go anterior entry reconstruct those three disc areas there rebuild that and then posterior entry and get to L23 which is the new problem and he referred to it as a big enchilada. He said you'll be in the surgery for about eight to ten hours and you better get off your off the road for six months. It was very bad news actually, quite terrifying because having been through it once the pain is very very excruciating. For weeks and weeks you're really uh, the tears flow, nothing really keeps that pain from diminishing unless you take the very heavy stuff and I never get into that I just want to protect my future as well and actually I've not taken nothing for pain for the last two years uh, even though it's been quite uh, heavy on the back but uh, a lot of prayer a lot of uh, efforts and um, some other palliative treatments I took in India and then um, they did some retesting and said we don't need a metal with the lower back we'll just do L23 and that'll be a two-hour surgery and six to eight weeks off the road and uh, hopefully uh, you'll be back full steam. So do pray for me. Um, second week of May I'll be silenced one way or the other for a few months and uh, my wife can tell me anything she wants to me at that time and I'll sign it. Uh, that's the way it'll be. Well thanks so much for coming and uh, sorry for that little personal uh, boulevard excursion just to let you know that between the sessions I'll probably just go back and rest it a little bit. I can't stay in the same position for too long. It does get a little bit discomforting because uh, the, the nerve is now involved in 2-3 and that does create some degree of um, trauma to the right leg and hopefully once the surgery is done that'll be uh, taken care of. By God's grace and every other way I've been very healthy. My lifestyle doesn't help my back. I was on the road over 200 days last year and so that's not even good for a normal back. And these days with the planes, you're lucky they give you a seat. Um, <laughs> they charge you for the pillow. They don't give you any food. One of these days, they'll charge you for using the air vent above you. And uh, I'm just, um, it's no longer a fun kind of travel. No longer they're merging. Hopefully, they'll expand the seats when they merge two seats put together to make at least one seat for the bigger made ones. Tom wrote to me on uh, several months ago in terms of what theme to address here. And, uh, you know, we uh, think of many, many uh, subjects to address. And I have to say to you, as a Christian apologist and one dealing with the philosophical issues, I'll be very honest with you, those rigorous themes get rather tiresome. 
you know, after some time you're sort of beating the same horse or uh, answering the same question, and uh, granted it may be a fresh question for the questioner, but if the philosopher and the apologist is not careful, all of your faith becomes very cerebral. And it is not at all surprising that many great apologists and Christian philosophers actually end up with some very serious personal issues in their own lives and struggles of various kinds. I won't get into them because it would be easy to sort of um, uh, boxing people in, start boxing people in, and you might start thinking of one apologist or one philosopher or another. But uh, believe me, I move in the ranks with them. And many times we talk about this. We all get concerned that when you wrestle with intensely philosophical issues, there is a great danger of getting so slanted that the bridge between the head and the heart never ever gets connected. And it is critical that that uh, uh, amputation not take place. There has to be the connection between the head and the heart. I believe at times uh, Jesus spoke in parables and he spoke in a way that mystified his listening audience because he did not want to always lay it at the lowest shelf. He said, you've got to seek, you've got to pursue, and then you will find, you shall search for me and find me when you shall search for me with all your heart. And you have to follow him with heart and mind and strength and soul and all of that. So there is that pursuit element. I don't want to diminish that one bit, and tomorrow morning when we deal with defending the faith we live, I will get into that. Some of the thorny areas in which we must answer the questions, the hard, pointed, honest questions. And there's one thing to be said in defense of the new uh, hate theists, as I call them, but uh, they really are so, uh, so potent in their writings, so the, the, the venom in it is uh, not softened in any way, whether you're talking about Dawkins or Hitchens or Harris or Dennett, they're just both fists flailing and for one period of time a few months ago, three of the top ten in the bestseller list were written by the new breed of atheists. I lecture at Oxford University, I'm a senior uh, honorary senior research fellow there now at Wycliffe Hall, so I lecture there three times a year. And the last time I was lecturing there, the main story in the Oxford newspaper was from Richard Dawkins asking the, for the consideration that students who believe in a creator and a designer actually not be admitted to Oxford University anymore because they'll be depriving some truly intellectual person of a legitimate seat rather than this lame-brained and fairy tale kind of thinking. The irony of that is that the motto of Oxford is, the Lord is my light. Here he is, revealing what often happens with a radical liberalism. And I say it carefully, or a radical relativism. You ain't seen such bigotry as you see that radical relativism when it gets into the seat of power. Uh, it's like going to a conservative seminary. You read all of the liberal scholars. But you go into a liberal seminary, very seldom do you actually read the conservatives. And so when you're defending the faith with somebody who's graduated from a radically liberal institution, they're not even aware of the conservative scholars who have responded to the questions that they have had thrown at them. Uh, Sam Harris, in, his, in an interview with, on television, made the comment, if I had a magic wand to eradicate faith or uh, eradicate, er, eradicate religion or eradicate rape, he said, I would uh, choose to eradicate religion. I'd uh, take that as an eradication over against rape. And you know, you wonder if he would say that if uh, a mother or a sister or a daughter or a wife had been the victim of a rapacious act, would he really say that? Does he understand what he is even saying? The violation of the sacredness of somebody's personal life in that fashion? But they're hitting hard. Some of their arguments are very good and must be taken seriously, but the venom behind it shows that it's really ideologically driven. There's not a single new argument offered in defense of atheism or a single new thorn in the flesh of theism. It's just a matter of trying to put the answer together in a way that affirms all of reality. That's the point. Reality comes to you from multitude, uh, in multitudinous intimita intimations. It comes in many different directions. It comes existentially. It comes in the imagination. 
It comes in the form of the arts. It comes in the form of reason. And if you can find a coherent package to affirm all of these without violating reason and logic, then you've probably found the best worldview to express what it is that really affirms reality as it comes to you and invades your life both from outside and is there very much within you. So we'll take on some of that tomorrow, understanding the new challenges and uh, how do we defend the faith in the face of such uh, daunting attacks. And the book, the end, uh, he wrote his book, The End of Faith, uh, calling for the abolition of religion, Sam Harris did. He's a student of neuroscience at Stanford, and uh, uh, I have responded to him in the book called The End of Reason, and actually it may not even be in the bookstores. We, I just got my publication copies this week. Uh, however, it'll be there within a few days at any of the local bookstores. We had to keep it brief. We had to keep it within the length that he had. I have no doubt he would respond, and we will have uh, some ongoing dialogue in that. But uh, at least we've tried to respond to some of the hard questions that he has raised. So tonight I want to talk to you from the subtitle of the book that some of you may get. I think Tom said they have it outside beyond uh, opinion that my entire team penned. I hope you'll get a hold of it. And uh, frankly, I think it is one of the most important works our ministry has ever released. And uh, it is quite a thick one. I did. Uh, three or four chapters in it, and then the rest of my colleagues spend one each, at least most of them did, including Alistair McGrath and John Lennox. They are adjuncts on the faculties of uh, RZIM. I see somebody holding the end of reason, so it must be available in the bookstores. Um, there we are, good for you. I thank you and the publisher thanks you. Uh, <laughs> and we've got some Beyond Opinion copies here too. I would like you to take that as a book to study it and I'd like you at some time to especially study the chapter on the Holy Spirit or the Trinity by L.T. Jayachandran in there, and then the chapter on Islam written by a former terrorist and a former Muslim who has now committed his life to Christ who also serves as an adjunct with us. It'll be a book that I think J.P. Moreland, Norm Geisler, many who have read it have said that really it's uh, a book that was long time overdue in the finest in genre. And I can say that to you because I'm very grateful to the Lord for my colleagues. They have worked very hard in one strand of apologetics to address that chapter. And I hope it'll have a very long shelf life because it covers apologetics from both, si from, from both the existential and the theoretical. But the subtitle says this, Living the Faith We Defend. And Publishers Weekly ran a critique of the book, and I think their critique was a good one. They said the publisher was weekly gave it a tremendous affirmation with this, this negative concern. He said, I wish there were more chapters on the subtitle than the title itself on living the faith we defend. And in fact, they said, I wonder if uh, Ravi would consider writing one as a sequel to that on the subtitle. Something lost here, are we all right? Maybe I was leaning against it. And so uh, I'd like to do that sometime, maybe when I'm recovering from uh, the post-traumatic surgery or whatever, uh, living the faith we defend. So I'm speaking on that tonight. In the beginning of the book, uh, Beyond Opinion, I made this comment. When I became a new Christian, uh, I was the only Christian uh, uh, in the group of friends that I had. None of them knew the Lord. They were all from other faiths. Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs, skeptics, Buddhists, Jains, every faith. There was not a single Christian believer in the group. And so as I began my task of reaching some of my friends to Christ and wonderfully saw the results coming, one of my uh, closest friends, in fact, he was my closest friend at that time, who was a student uh, of engineering, went on to become a nuclear physicist, came and did his uh, work at MIT and became the chief safety expert at the Atomic Energy of Canada. He was an Orthodox Hindu Brahmin, Sundar Krishnan. Some of you may have heard him. Uh, he gave up his career in nuclear physics and has become a pastor in Toronto, one of the finest expositors that I know. Many years thought he liked me, found out I liked my sister. He's my brother-in-law now <laughs> and uh, living, living in Toronto. I give you all that preamble for this. Sundar was a very brilliant guy and is probably one of the brightest minds I have ever known. He was a gold medalist student. And I remember he and I were talking to his cousin. We were still in our teens. We were in Sundar's home, and his cousin was also a student of engineering. And we were talking to him about Christ, and here's what he said. He said this. 
He said, you know, I believe your lives have been changed. He said, I can see it. I can see it in you guys. Your lives have changed. He said, but I also want to make this comment. I don't believe it has anything to do with any supernatural birth or anything like that. He said, no matter what you say, I don't buy that. He said, this thing is entirely psychological. He said, I have met so many Christians for whom there is absolutely no difference in their lifestyle. In fact, their standards are much lower than most of the men and women whom I call friends. They are hypocritical, they are duplicitous, their standards are double, they don't live privately what they claim publicly. He said, I know that for a fact. He said, I'm not making an excuse, I'm just telling you, I don't believe in any one of these religions, they're all psychological theories. And it works for some and doesn't work for others. He said, it may have worked for you, but it's got nothing to do with the supernatural birth. And what staggered me about his assertion was the fact that, as far as I knew at that time and as far as I know now, the Christian faith is the only faith which claims to have a supernatural new birth. The Muslim doesn't claim this. The Buddhist doesn't claim this, the Hindu doesn't claim this, and the Jain doesn't claim this, or the Sikh doesn't claim this. No other worldview, and if I'm wrong, you correct me. It is only the Christian that claims that this is not born out of the will of the flesh, nor out of the will of man, but this is born of the Holy Spirit. Now that assumption puts us to a very serious apologetic critique. Why is it then that so many of us don't just disappoint others, we actually disappoint ourselves? We find that we do not have that new power that we claim. I don't think it causes us to doubt whether we want to follow Christ, but it does raise some serious questions within ourselves. Why is it that I don't really sense that imperative or sense that transformation or sense that change? Now, I've tried to address this in one of my chapters in the book, and I hope in some ways at least I have touched the nerve of it, but we have to go much deeper than that. What I want you to do is if you've got your Bibles with you, turn with me to the book of Daniel. And I'm going to take a background text from him, and I won't just be dwelling on this text, but I want to keep this in the background. And um, is there anything I need to do with the sound equipment? If somebody can point to me, is it because I'm leaning forward? Is there something loose, or is it all right? Am I right? all right now? Okay, I'll try not to lean against the lectern. It does seem to create some sense of um, displeasure. Pardon me? Bibles are under the chairs. If you don't have it, thank you very much. And uh, for those of you who memorized it, you don't need to take the one <laughs> under the chair. <laughs> but this is the book of Daniel. And I want to read for you the first chapter in its entirety because I think it puts it in historic context and tells you the storyline. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, as Daniel chapter 1, king of Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men, without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Please test your servants for ten days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. 
Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the God took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel can understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Now the story of the Old Testament is really a story of valleys and mountains. At times they are climbing the peak of the mountain looking very good, very decent, very sophisticated in their walk with God and then at other times they're down in the dumps and in the valleys and you wonder if anything is going to happen at all to turn this nation around. I want you to understand and go along two sets of lines here so that I can position this. The first line is this, God gave them what the blueprint was for true godliness. He gave them the blueprint for true godliness. What it is that a genuine godly person and a genuine godly nation looks like. And if you want to find that out, you'd have to go back to probably the most punctuatedly quoted book in the Old Testament uh, chapter, and that's Deuteronomy chapter 8. Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy more often, I think, than any other book in the Old Testament, and Deuteronomy chapter 8 is the one chapter to which he refers in the entire temptation episode in the wilderness when the devil is actually quoting scripture to him to misuse scripture and put a different spin on it. The devil quotes him with scripture and Jesus responds with the context of that quote to give the larger meaning. So Deuteronomy chapter 8 is obviously a very important chapter in Holy Scripture. And in that chapter he gives us three characteristics of the godly person. Humility, spirituality, and faith. Number one, I took you through this wandering so that you would see what was in your own heart. What he's really saying is this, you know, from where I took them to where I took them, I could have taken them in a six to eight week span. But I allowed them to wander for 40 years because there was a very important thing I wanted them to learn over that generation. I wanted them to see what the human heart is like. What their heart was like. This is the most difficult recognition in your life and mine. To understand what you and I are capable of. Don't trust your heart in all situations. I can tell you this, that when you take a look at the, the extent to which the human heart can become depraved, you will be very careful before you cross certain lines. The most oft-repeated statement after the Holocaust by the historians who studied the Holocaust will come back with this simple statement. These were ordinary people. Ordinary people. When um, Peter Malkin of the Israeli Mossad had captured Adolf Eichmann in Argentina, and in a cloak and dagger operation told in the book, the, you know, uh, The House on Garibaldi Street, how he smuggled Eichmann out and brought him back to Jerusalem. Malkin's entire summary was when he was sitting right beside Malkin, having injected him with something in order to put him into a stupor and then got him into the plane and then put him on a train and they were getting him back. He said, when I sat next to him and looked at him and saw all the markings on his arms and we knew who he was, he said, what shocked me was what an ordinary, quiet, decent-looking man he looked to be. And so I say this. I remember I was telling the audience yesterday when I was speaking to them. I remember when I left India, being told by so many different people, you're going to the West now, 
they have a very low morality. You know, we have a higher morality out here. Be careful, don't compromise. All kinds of things go on there and they judge it by what they see on the screen and all of the statistics that are openly revealed. It has taken me years to realize the same things go on in India that they go on here. The only thing is it never gets publicized. It's all behind closed doors and under the, uh, dusted under the rugs. We are no better out there, and if any one of you thinks we are, I'd be quite ready to challenge you. It's just not true. The human heart is the same all over the world, whether it's east or west. And that's why God said he wants you to recognize what your heart is capable of. That's why when he says, you know, my son, to, to, to discipline your heart, there's a very important point that he is making here. So the first thing he wants you to know is understand what you may be capable of. Many preachers fall, not overnight, they have fallen over a period of time because they actually thought their heart could withstand slow seductions and know where to draw the line till suddenly they find out they've been had and they have betrayed themselves before they've betrayed anybody else. So you understand your heart and I think that is a very important thing for us to tease and to understand. So you must be, humility is the first point of response to God himself. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. Being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became obedient unto death even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also has exalted him and given to him a name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The first beatitude tells us the blessed one is the one who is poor in spirit. If you don't understand this, you don't understand what the gospel is all about. The first step to salvation is the humility of heart and recognizing you are not what people think you are. Your duplicity and my duplicity goes much, much deeper. You know, uh, it's funny, recently I was, uh, when I went to see the doctor to talk about, um, is something rubbing against it? I hope not. I was talking to the doctor and, uh, you know, I said to him, you know, doctor, I'm willing to live with the pain. I've lived with a lot of pain for the last two years. It's okay and so on. I was quite actually embarrassed but sobered by the fact that my wife piped in and said, doctor, actually, I don't think you realize how tough it is. He realizes how hard it's been on him. And what she was saying in a very nice way is, he's not been the easiest to live with when he's hurting. <laughs> She's right. She's right. You know, we mask all of this, and those of us who meet each other in public, we think the public persona is what is also the private persona. It is not. The human heart is desperately wicked, and we must understand it. But then he says, from, hum from, from humility, we move to spirituality, that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So what your diet needs to have, if you're going to walk after the way of God, is that spiritual food. It is spirituality that holds hand in hand with truth that will make you the strong person. Not mere spirituality, but spirituality that has the handmaiden of truth that it is holding on to. So you, you must realize that at the core, your problem and my problem is not moral, it's spiritual. Many times I go to India and somebody will say to me, uh, what about Mahatma Gandhi? What's, what, what's Mahatma Gandhi's destiny? And I'll say to them, look, I don't settle anybody's destiny, only God does. But I have a question for you. I'll say, are you telling me he was so perfect a man that he did not need God's forgiveness? I said, tell me. Are you telling me he was so perfect a man that he did not need God's forgiveness? And by, on, on his own terms and on his own biographical sketch, you see how he himself said even at the end of his life it was a constant source of frustration to me that the peace I have constantly longed for I have never been able to find said Gandhiji himself and so humility is the first lesson spirituality is the second with the handmaiden of truth so it's humility spirituality and faith now faith is not credulity it is not that you are asked to believe something that has no rational basis 
But God has put enough into this world to make faith in him a most reasonable thing, and he's left enough out to make it impossible to live by sheer reason alone. God has put enough into this world to make faith in him a most reasonable thing, but he's left enough out to make it impossible to live by sheer reason alone. You cannot live, lift yourself by your own rational bootstraps in an attempt to answer everything. In fact, from Bertrand Russell of years gone by to J.L. Mackey of Australia to Kai Nielsen of Canada, all of the finest atheists of our time will tell you that reason alone does not lead you to morality. Reason does not dictate it here. It has to either transcend reason or come in some other way intuitively or whatever. When I, when I, when I was in the Philippines a few weeks ago, some fellow was talking to me about uh, uh, making a big case for evolutionary ethics and so on, that he was arguing for it. So I said, all right. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, where did biological evolution begin? And he harked back, he said, well, most his most uh, evolution theorists will tell, tell you it probably goes back millions of years into Africa and so on. I said, so maybe geographically, that's where it began? He said, I would say so. I said, where did evolutionary ethics begin? Where did evolutionary ethics begin? Did that begin in Africa too? You see, we don't answer the question that is begging to be answered. If evolutionary ethics holds true, can I condemn anybody's ethic without implying that they have evolved less than me? Is there no point of reference on the basis of which to ascribe a right or a wrong? Even Abraham Lincoln in his second inaugural address made that comment that we can only come to the terms of truth as God enables us to see that truth. It's not just hanging out there in a vacuum. Faith is a very real fact of every discipline. Every discipline. The question is, is it based on reason or is it hanging there all by itself without any justifiable propositions with which to start? And so that blender, I don't know how many of you saw the debate between Richard Dawkins and John Lennox. My colleague uh, John Lennox teaches with us, um, well known to Tom Terrence, he's a triple doctorate, teaches pure mathematics at, uh, uh, Green, at uh, yeah, Green College in Oxford. Every time he introduced, he's, introduced and he's introduced as professor of teaching pure mathematics, I tell him, John, John, I never thought there was any such thing as pure mathematics. All mathematics to me is impure because I never did very, I never did very well in it. But he debated Dawkins, and I hope if you haven't seen it, you will see that debate, and he kept pinning Dawkins on this issue. Don't tell me that the scientific method is purely uh, rational and transcendent over any factor of faith or trust or belief and so on. The question is, is it based on a rational belief or is it based on an irrational belief? Humility, spirituality, faith. If you don't have these three, you do not have the blueprint of what God has said makes for the pattern that he has for you and me. You will have to trust him in the toughest times when everything else is caving around you. You'll have to latch on to what you know to be true in order to enable you to carry on through that moment and through that time. You will have to feed the spirit to nurture the soul and you will have to have a humble spirit. If arrogance and hubris dominates your life, you can never be a godly person because at the core of all sin is pride which brought Lucifer himself to his fall. So that's the blueprint. Then the leaders like Solomon, Rehoboam, and Jeroboam came. You know, you saw the untamed passions of a gifted man. You saw wanton power in a weak man and the unteachable temperament of a privileged man. Untamed passions of a gifted person, wanton power in a weak person, and the unteachable temperament of a privileged person. And the nation spiraled down, and they find themselves now in captivity. No nation that ultimately hits out against spiritual principles can survive no matter how strong it claims to be. And I, I remember being at a hearing in Washington some time ago and Peggy Noonan asked the question, did a terrorist fear anything? 
And nobody answered, and I said, can I attempt an answer? And I'm not sure I'm 100% right. I said, but my attempted answer is this. They would fear a morally and spiritually strong America much more than they would fear a militarily strong America. They would fear a morally and spiritually strong United States much more than they would have. And I've talked to them, and they know that if they can find the Achilles heel of America's self-reliance, that she no longer is a godly nation, they know by sheer perseverance they will win. And I'll tell you why. Follow me very carefully, because we'll get into this a little more tomorrow. This former terrorist who came from Islam radicalism gave me this little picture, and I've never lost it. He told me, he said, Brother Ravi, he said, when I was a Muslim, this is the picture of my life. The circle and a dot inside. The circle was my faith. The dot inside was my life. He said, for more Christ most Christians that I meet, the circle is their life. The dot inside is their faith. You understand the difference? The circle was my faith. The dot inside was my life. He said, to me, my life was dispensable. Didn't matter because my faith would remain. He said, most Christians I met, the circle was their life, the dot was their faith, the dot was an aspect of their lives. And he said, with that kind of contrast, it's not hard to tell who's going to win. So if you and I as believers want to understand what faith actually means, we better understand it is greater than our physical life. It is something that is all-encompassing, your life and mine. You know, the last few days I was telling Tom Terrence, a hand, well, there's one particular radio station and a handful of people who are very upset that I prayed at the National Day of Prayer and they want to consign me to an eternity with uh, all of those who will not be very happy the rest of their lives. And uh, oh, the, the vitriol, the anger, the bitterness, and all of this that is gone. And you just read, I don't, I don't read most of it, it but I've, I've had to read some of it because people from all over the world have been writing and sending me some of these quotes. I said, what on earth is the matter with these people? And you know, I was sitting with my wife and daughter yesterday and son and at the table and I said, you know, every time I go overseas to speak and I go in some very terrible situations, I pack my suitcase with the possibility that I may not come back. I pack my suitcase with things for my back that if somebody wants to whisk me away in a hostage crisis and lie me on some concrete floor somewhere for two to three weeks at a time, at least I'll have some degree of relief from my pain and my back and after that there's nothing more I can do. You pack your suitcase with a commitment that you're going to honor God and to glorify God and for the cause of Christ. And then there are a handful of people, rabid extremists, who don't like the way you do things and want to take you to task. I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I've come to terms in my life that my commitment to Christ is greater than my physical life. I've come to terms with it. It's not a fun feeling. It's not something you hope ever has to be tested. I hope it is never tested because when the testing comes, I'm sure there's a weakness we'll all find in ourselves that we never knew we had. But I'm also thinking we'll find some strength in ourselves that God will give that we never thought we'd actually had. And so what I'm challenging you today, if you want to live the faith that you defend, your faith has to be greater than your physical life. You have to come to terms with that. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That does not mean we end up in some kind of a couldn't care less mentality about life, no. But we must understand what our faith actually means. And until the Christian in the West comes to terms with that understanding of their Christian faith, we will never be able to win the victory of living persuasive lives because we will be outdone on those schemes. Now, how did Daniel demonstrate this? Humility, spirituality, and faith. How did he show this? The first thing he did was he, he trained his appetite. 
he, may, he drew the line of resistance by training his appetite. He said, I don't seat me down at the king's banquet table every night because night after night of this marvelous soft touch food, I'll get so spoiled out here that I will be gradually won over and seduced over to the king's machinations. I don't want this. And he said to the steward, look, why don't you just give me an ordinary diet, water and vegetables, and after a few days, if I don't look as strong as the rest of the men, you can then change it. But I just don't want to mess with my appetite here and gradually get attracted to the way of comfort that the king wants me to enjoy. So you draw the line of resistance by training your appetite. The best way I know to live a spiritual life and a godly life is to train your appetite. You train your hungers. And so what I say to you men is this. Don't open that pornographic magazine even for the first time. If you're young and you're at that stage, listen to me. Don't log on to a website that will plant images in your mind, that will plant new hungers and change who you really are. With each seduction and each fulfillment, you are not the same person that you were before. And today the internet has taken so many marriages and torn them apart because they have got the men imagining things with which they can never be fulfilled. They plant hungers that you will never be fulfilled with. I see this in so many places of my travel, and uh, I just absolutely boggles my mind and breaks my heart. I have seen young couples whose marriage has been shattered over this very issue. Learn in your income not to get so spoiled that you will never learn how to give generously. Don't ever get sucked into the syndrome of self-indulgence and forget the needs of many out there who have far less. Let your life be involved in giving and generously and sharing and don't get suctioned into a world of such comfort that the, dif the distinction between need and luxury is absolutely lost at the same time. Don't get so busy time and time and time again that you actually don't take time to walk with God and talk with God and think you're actually being successful while you're squandering all those other moments of walking alone with him. If the Lord Jesus himself even went away from healing the masses because he needed his time alone with God, the Father, imagine how much more you and I need that training of the mind and the discipline of the will. And it is not at all possible for us to really walk closely with God unless we train our hungers. Uh, you know, as an itinerant man, this was a clear lesson for me very early in life. I realized half my life I was alone. And as the ministry grew, uh, most of the times I would stay in homes. But as the ministry grew and your physical needs change in many ways, you end up living in hotel rooms merely to be able to carry a routine day after day that is healthier for you than having to live at somebody else's timetable. But you know what happens then? There's no, really no accountability. You're all alone in that room. And now I don't travel alone. I always travel with an associate. But even then, they're not with you 24 hours. If you really want to uh, play a game uh, with others, you can play that game because in many ways you are alone. You are uh, miles and miles away from home. And I've learned certain habits and done it for me. They have been very helpful. They may not be the same for you, but whatever your life and lifestyle, draw the line. A medical doctor one day phoned me Forgive me if you're familiar with this story. It was late at night, nearly the midnight hour, and I was about to go to sleep, and he said, Ravi, I said, I need to talk to you. I'm sorry to wake you up. I said, is everything okay? He said, no, it's not okay. He said, uh, I just, he is an emergency room surgeon. He said, they brought a woman in for emergency surgery tonight, this evening, he said, and uh, she had been so badly beaten up by whoever she was living with. I'd never seen a body so battered, so broken. Every major bone in her body was, was shattered. 
He said, and the nurses brought her in, and the paramedics brought her in. They said, Doc, she's gone. He said, I didn't want to leave her like that, so I decided I would do, try some dramatic surgery to see if we could revive her. He said, I cut the side of the rib cage so I could get to the heart and do a direct heart massage. And he said, I literally had the heart in my hand massaging that heart, and it just turned into blubber. He said, nothing responded. He said, I walked away just so shaken up with what I'd just seen on that operating table. He said, as I was washing my hands, the nurse came and said, Doc, I think you need to see this, and took the bag and was empty, and empty the bag out. He said, as I was washing my hands, I noticed I'd nicked my finger a little bit while I'd plunged my hand through the rib cage. And when the nurse emptied the bag, it was full of drug paraphernalia. She was obviously a druggie and using all these dirty needles, and he noticed he'd nicked his finger. And he said, I am terrified. He said, I am terrified. I said, why? He said, I may have made contact with very diseased blood. I said, is the cut deep? He said, no, it's just a paper thin cut. I said, are you telling me that puts you at risk for something as uh, de deadly as uh, losing your entire immune syndrome and so on? He said, absolutely, it doesn't take anything more than a paper thin cut. If that puts the human body at risk, that little paper thin cut Protect yourself from the lacerations of the soul. You must protect yourself from the lacerations of the soul. So if you're going to live the faith you defend, you're going to have to draw the lines of uh, resistance. But secondly, he, he drew the line of dependence. He drew the line of dependence with all of the opportunities he had to study and read and the literature and the knowledge. He knew that all of his knowledge was not going to help him. He said, God, I'm going to need your wisdom. I'm going to need your wisdom beyond measure in order to interpret these dreams, in order to know exactly how it is I'm to respond to whatever is my task right now before this king. And here is where I pause to say to you, don't ever think you will cease to need the word of God in your life. You will never reach a stage where you don't need the word of God in your life. I don't know how you do your devotions. I don't know how you practice your devotional life. But you, I was speaking to the men about prayer this week and I said, you know, you have to move through stages. We pray because God commanded us to pray. But then we move to prayer because we need to pray. Then we move because we want to pray. And then we move to the stage where we love to pray. From being commanded, to needing it, to wanting it, to loving it. If you're not at that stage yet of loving that hour of prayer, keep at it till you become someone who loves that time alone with God. And I said, I'm not putting you on. I don't need any more books. I haven't even read all the books I have. You know, I don't, uh, I don't need any more shirts. I've got all the shirts I need. And we do, or we go through all of this. I said, but I'll tell you one thing I would like, but I don't know if you can find it. I said, when I was a youngster and a rank skeptic, my parents used to take me to an Anglican church. And I started to memorize the prayer book because I needed to time the service. I wanted to make sure I knew how much longer we had left of this torture. <laughs> I knew exactly when there were seven minutes to go. And I then would picture myself on the cricket field and just waiting to get there. And that's why I said, you know, now when I go back to Delhi, now that I've come to know the Lord, I always visit the cathedral where I was raised. And I go and I, I, I kneel there now. Think of all the years I squandered. Made fun of the vicar imitated people with hopeless voices who dared to sing. You know, this kind of stuff. All this stuff that I did, and I was the clown of the group imitating all this stuff, you know. I, I could do a perfect mimicry of everything that went wrong in the service. I lost it. I lost those years. So I said, now when I go back to Delhi, I've taken my wife there. I just kneel on those benches, and I said, honey, if you can find me an Anglican prayer bench, my birthday, that's what I want. And my wife is a sleuth. She knows how to find these things. 
she scoured hither and yon and she found a beautiful old antique, an English French, you know, they had a royal crest and the fleur de lis and uh, obviously this had been on some kind of an English French uh, liaison. It has a beautiful kneeling bench and a place to place the Bible. That's my morning time with God. It's where I wait for wisdom. It's where I wait for wisdom. When Daniel said, I need your wisdom to interpret this dream, think of the wisdom our nation needs right now. Listen to the nonsense that goes on in some of the political stuff. No other way to describe it. When I was overseas a few weeks ago, somebody said to me, it's nice to know your political process has as many crazy things that happens as ours does. And rather than even getting to the issues and discussing what it is that a leader is going to do and think and be like, we've got all this mudslinging that goes on and stuff and you say, is this what we are coming to? One upmanship over the other. I have one less skeleton in my closet than you do. Oh, is there a time when our nation needs wisdom? My wife and I were with the Crown Prince of Jordan. Oh, actually, he's the Crown Prince of, of Iraq. He is the cousin of King Hussein of Jordan, the last heir to the throne in Iraq, Prince Rad. We were in the palace courts with him some time ago. And uh, I had just come from meetings in Syria, went to Jordan. He, they, their office phoned and said, would you please come and meet? And we weren't even possibly, probably dressed. I said, we're not. We just got off a plane. He said, no, he'd like to see you. So we went. And uh, halfway through the meeting, well, over a cup of tea, I said to him, Prince Rod, what is the greatest need of the hour in the Middle East? He said, the greatest need of the hour in the Middle East is the greatest need in the world right now. I said, what? He said, two things leaders with integrity and young people have a model and a leader to follow leaders with integrity and young people have a model and a leader to follow it's almost like he'd been asked that question before and he thought his answer through and so if you want to be a man or woman of wisdom you're not going to find it just by all the books you read you're going to find it as you study the word and commune with the living god day after day. And you know what? Uh, before I move to my final point, I love books. You must read. In fact, when I was doing my studies at Cambridge, we used, uh, any one of you has been to Cambridge. Uh, now I'm a professor at Oxford. I hope nobody quotes me, but Cambridge is prettier than Oxford. <laughs> Cambridge is like a garden, beautiful garden, King's Parade out there with all the big schools. And as you enter King's Parade from one end, I think it's right near Trinity College, Opposite Trinity College is Heifer's Bookstore. If any one of you has been there, it has thousands of volumes. I remember every time I entered Heifer's with my wife, I actually had to say to her, honey, if you can wait a moment, I have to use the restroom. I'm too excited right now. <laughs> every time, every time. You go to Wales, that's the greatest used bookstore in the world in a town called Heon Wai. Always had to first use the restroom before going into those bookstores. Books, marvelous companions. But no book transcends this one. If you believe that and you hunger after this, you will live the life of faith you defend. And number three, humility, spirituality, and faith. When I come to this thing called faith, it's his line of uh, confidence, his line of, uh, his line of resistance, his line of dependence, and his line of confidence. Here he has the faith that no matter what, and here's what he says, you know, our God will deliver us from this fire, but even if he doesn't, we will not bend our knee to another God. My greatest confidence today is in certain arenas of, of America. Number one is the business community. I have seen such dedicated businessmen and women as I've traveled. I'm amazed at the bigness of their hearts and the dedication of their lives. If I don't do my 
devotions on my prayer bench in the morning, I actually go and park outside of Dunkin' Donuts in my car, and I'll sit with my Bible and get a cup of coffee, and I'll read it in there. And you know, in the early morning hour at 6 or 6.30, whether you go to the tiny little waffle houses in Atlanta, or the Chick-fil-A's, or the Dunkin' Donuts, or whatever, you'll see so many businessmen all by themselves with that cup of coffee and this in front of their hand. And you realize at that point, you're seeing men and women who are building and strengthening their faith so that they have the power to live through that day. First is the business community I see. The second I see is in many professional athletes. <coughs> Many professional athletes. Recently, my son and I were one of the finest pitchers in baseball today. I'll leave him unnamed. He's truly Hall of Fame bound. And we spent three days with him in the preseason while they were playing and uh, stayed in his home. Muscle bound character, powerful, powerful piece of. Uh, humanity. Whenever I speak to the Atlanta Braves when I'm in town, I always walk in and say, again, it's terrible to walk into a room and be the only one who fails the physical. <laughs> These guys are such specimens of humanity. Every morning, he'd spend three hours and working out, an afternoon, tremendous. And he sat over dinner with Nathan and me one night, and he said, you know, one day all of this is going to go, and it doesn't matter. He said, I've had a great life. It doesn't matter. He said, my supreme passion as a pitcher and as an athlete is to follow God, to love him, and use the gifts he's given me. And when it's gone, it's over. I will have no regrets. I will not look back. I'll walk away from this. There are so many athletes like that I've seen and I talk to who will actually just come and wrap their arms around you before a game and say, pray for me. It's a tremendous strength in this nation. And then there's the youth who are willing to go, I don't know how many American kids I've met in some of the most incredible spots of this world, and I say, how did you ever get here? You know, my daughter Naomi, she's a tiny little one. My mother used to say hot pepper, the smaller the pepper, the hotter the pepper is, and my daughter is one of those. <laughs> Straight from graduating from Wheaton, she went to the mountains of Harabakoa and the Dominican Republic to work with orphans. And her life now is spent in all kinds of dangerous places. She goes to Amsterdam and walks into the booth, women selling themselves, and she'll pull the curtain and say, can I have 15 minutes of your time? And the men who own those women are literally breathing down her neck. She'll have a Bible in her purse talk to them, pray with them, leave. Right now, she's on loan from our ministry working with invisible children in Uganda. And one day I looked at her and I said, honey, why are you doing all this? You know, can't you live a little more safely, you know, all around all of this? She said, dad, when we were young, we asked you why you did all of this. You said that we had to trust God. Now it's your turn. <laughs> now it's your turn. You know what incredible things our young people are doing? I see that hope. I see that hope. And it is really in the strength of the so-called laity that the church actually functions. And so as I leave you with the challenge tonight, draw the line of resistance to train your appetite. Draw the line of dependence so you go beyond your education to the word of God and draw your line of confidence so that you will depend not just on the happy moments, but come what may, your life will be committed to the glory of God. You know, my father-in-law died, coming September will make three years, I guess. My son will tell you, I don't know if I knew a finer man. I really don't think I did. I'll never forget the day I had to go and ask him for permission to marry Margie, and I was so terrified. I paced the floor outside of his office, and I think I celebrated a few birthdays just thinking about it. Because he was such a disciplined man, such an honorable man. He was in the Second World War, a veteran pilot and navigator. He carried his Bible and his hymn book all over the world. He believed in doing his duty to God, his duty to country. And yet he struggled when he was stricken with cancer. From diagnosis to death, it was three, months, three to four months. 
And I remember us sitting by him one by one. My son wrote him a beautiful letter and said, Grandpa, you know, you're probably the finest man we could have had for a grandpa, all the honor and all the respect that everybody had for him. Married 63 or 64 years to his wife, Jean, my mother-in-law. And I spent a lot of time with him before he died, and then I had to go away for some meetings, and his daughters were standing around his bed just before he passed away, unknown to them as he was fading. His body had shriveled up by this point to a point where he was just ripping his clothes off him, and Margie, my wife, said, you know, it was so sad to see a man of such dignity suddenly beginning to lose it. He was a perfect gentleman. Never saw him get into a car before letting his wife in first. Never saw him sit down before helping her with the chair first. Never saw him except that he was always a gentleman at the hard times and at the easy times. And then, gradually, he began to fade into solid quietness. I was flying there to Toronto to see him. His three of his four daughters were beside him and his, ma his wife. And they told me this. He said at one point he opened his eyes and even though he'd lost his voice, he looked at his wife of 63 years. I love you, he said. I love you. Six decades of honor and commitment. Could there have been anything better he could have said to her? I love you, Jean. He closed his eyes. A few men's moments again went by. He opened his eyes, looked to the heavens, and said this, amazing, just amazing. And he was gone. And Lord, haste the day when the faith shall be sight, and the clouds be rolled back as a scroll, and the trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. He died the way he'd lived, a life of honor and a life of total surrender to God. Draw the lines in the right places. Train your hungers, know what you depend on, and know where your confidence is. And then humility, spirituality, and faith come together to be conformed to the image of his son. We live it, and that's the greatest apologetic the world will ever see. So God bless you, and we'll take a 15-minute break, and then I'll come back and answer your questions. Thank you so much. Tom has the microphone here, and I'm assuming then the best way is just raise your hand, and uh, he'll, be, he'll do his best to hasten in your direction, and um, uh, I'll do my best to answer the question. If not, I will revert to Tom. Since he wins all the arguments, like I'll be happy to have him here, you know. <laughs> I'll be like the chauffeur, right? I'll be like the chauffeur, that's right. Now we've got one on the right hand there. I'll tell you what, what might be the best way to do this is if you will come up here. That'd be good. And right here, and then I will um, help you. <laughs> I will hold on to this microphone. Please, no speeches. Yeah. If you have questions, that's what this time is for. Yeah. Please come. Uh, Dr. Ravi, I remember you uh, talking about the same uh, uh, incident that you mentioned about beginning in time. Uh, I remember hearing you, listening to you in uh, uh, Dr. Dobson's interview. You stated the question as, what's the terrorists are afraid of? Uh, for oh, that yeah. you mentioned. Yeah. Uh, my question to you now is, uh, since you do get several chances to be with the politicians, do you ever uh, put this point across to them so we can benefit, the whole nation can benefit from this. <clears throat> it's a great theological, uh, theosophical you know, yes. point, I think. In case you didn't follow the question, um, he was raising the issue of uh, what, would a what would a terrorist really be afraid of. Uh, my point was that it would be afraid of a morally and spiritually strong America. So if I'm understanding the question, he's asking me if I've ever put this to some leadership and some political leaders and uh, pointed this out. Yes, indeed, I, even in the last, uh, even today I have, in talking to some of them. Um, it doesn't always, um, you know, it's a little bit like oftentimes you scold people for coming to church about those who are really not there. Uh, uh, why are you scolding the ones who are there about those who are not there? 
Uh, and so sometimes you're talking to politicians who agree with you rather than the ones who will disagree with you. But uh, because I have the opportunity to talk sometimes to the media, sometimes members of the judiciary in various countries, and many, many times I'm talking to university campuses where there's a thoroughgoing uh, secularism, uh, it does give them a lot of pause and does cause them to think about it. But this kind of thing, I think, can only begin when the church itself is living the faith that it is proclaiming. Then it spreads like salt and light. The transformation uh, from the outside is not uh, easy. If the inside is, there's no place to come. I had about a 14-hour conversation with a press reporter from one of the major networks in this country. I won't name it, but uh, they're all over the world. And uh, I just find them thoroughly distorting most news stories. Uh, and I was with one of their lead uh, reporters from uh, Asia, and we were sitting from Delhi to New York. It was a 16-hour nonstop. So we had quite a conversation. <laughs> and uh, I told him, I said, why do you distort the news so much? I said, every time I'm overseas and I listen to your news, it gets me even more upset about what you're doing to our nation and what you're describing the nation as. You're not reporting this very honestly and so on. And it's a very fascinating conversation we had. And he asked me a few questions, which I answered. And uh, then I challenged some of the stories they had told in the press, which I said are not true, and told them the stories that they ought to be reporting, which they've never reported on. And it was incredible how we sort of built a camaraderie as we were talking. And uh, when I got off at JFK in, in New York, I was on the, standing by the carousel waiting for my bags. And he was on the other side, and he came over to my side, and he gave me his card. He said, you know, Mr. Zacharias, he said, the problem is this. He said, you see a lot of what is going on, and so you know the big picture. He said, we basically entertain people with sound bites who really don't know the whole story. That was as much of an admission that there was no context to the text, which means it is really a pretext. It was uh, an ideology being driven across, but I think it made a difference even in that one life. So yes, I do tell some of the leaders, but uh, it, this thing cometh not out except by fasting and praying, I guess, I don't know. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Zacharias, I'd like to thank you, first of all, for what was a profound message earlier, uh, thank you, remarkably well-delivered. Uh, I'd like to ask you and recognize that charity may impel you to draw back from this question, or that perhaps unfamiliarity may make you, in a certain sense, uh, incompetent to deal with it, but is there anything wrong with the Christian message of Reverend Wright, as you understand it? Let, let me do my best to answer it without making it political, okay? I'll try my best not to make it political because I appreciate it and in, in my life uh, generally the choice is do you want to be stoned or do you want to be stabbed? <laughs> so uh, I think there's something very sad in what has happened and the sadness of it to me is this. The terms that are being bandied about now in the media to describe what is being said. And the first take that was given on it by the candidate himself, which troubled me, and then others picked up on it in every network, that what we were struggling against was an attempt that was being made at the social gospel. That's the term they use, the social gospel. That's not the right term for what is being done. If you talk about the social gospel and start using its, its term, uh, you go back to the times of Wesley and Booth, they were talking about the social imperatives of the gospel. That's what they meant. You cannot call something the social gospel that is socially offensive and divisive and unhinged from the gospel. That means it's neither. The gospel is a gospel of grace, love, forgiveness, when all things can be passed away and all things can become new. And it's the outreached arms of love that says, 
as wrong as whatever might have been, I'm willing to sit down at the table with love and forgive and start all over again and embrace you with the love of Christ. It is not the social gospel if it is, if it is preying upon hate, preying upon the baser instincts no matter who uses it for whatever cause. And so that's what I want to be careful about. And then when they talk about it, then uh, he himself was using the term called liberation theology and harking back to the Latin experiment on all of this. Liberation theology came anchored in Marxist socialistic doctrine, which is not the hub of the free enterprise system as which we believe it. So if you want to argue for the, for the liberation theologian's perspective, then you have to go to a completely different political ideology. And if that's what is being believed, then that's what needs to be said. That I'm actually asking for restructuring of our whole political theory. I'm not talking about the free enterprise system. I'm talking about uh, the Marxist doctrine of uh, from each according to his ability to each according to his need and so on and take it into a materialistic theory which, is, which was an unhappy wedding of the theologians in Latin America with a naturalistic materialistic theory of pseudo-Marxism. You simply could not pull the two together. So I think however well intentioned it may have been, and I don't want to comment on the political side of it, what was known, when it was known, and all this kind of stuff. That's for others to decide. I'm just saying as a theologian, I was troubled by the use of a term that is not representative of the historical use of the term. And if it was piggybacking upon the theological perspective of liberation theology, it then ought to be disclosed as that, that it is exactly the theory that is not in keeping. You talk to anyone in the development world, God gives Europe seven to one. You today stand in front of any audience in the United States. You don't even have to tell the whole story. Just, there was an experiment done in, in, in Dallas. One uh, disc jockey said, you know, Americans are not thinking people. And his partner said, what do you mean? He said, if you ask for money, you don't even have to tell them why they'll send it in. <laughs> and they had this bet, this about three years ago. You may remember the story. And he said, no, they won't. By the third day, 250,000 had come in. And he had to tell him to stop. He said, this is a joke. We don't need it. He just made some kind of a story, didn't tell where, didn't tell what, just said it was a great need and they ended up giving it to the Red Cross or something like that. I think if the American heart is touched for need and the faith-based initiatives and all of that that had some possibilities that could have been there, uh, there are ways in which from each according to his ability, you meet each according to their need. If the people who complain about what's happening here really saw what's happening in the rest of the world. You'd find out how serious the problem is on the other sides of the world. We at least have made some attempt to meet it. I could name countries for you today where I've walked through so-called sweat houses and seen women and children on whose backs huge amounts of monies are being made and the powers that be in the governments are not even dealing with it. One country I shall leave unnamed because I go there quite often. Where parents are selling their little girls in a huge market. Where are these voices of social well-being and help? During the World Cup of Soccer, my daughter told me 40,000 girls had been transported from across the country to be as prostitutes in Germany during the World Cup of Soccer. World Cup of Soccer. Where are the voices for these kinds of things? So I think, yes, if there are things to be made right, they ought to be made right. But you do that, you do not do that on the provocation of hate anger and all of the wrong reasons, you evoke the best response of love and a generous heart, which is exactly what the gospel is all about from the cross of Jesus Christ. So his messages, if they want to be categorized either as liberation theology, then they should be identified political in their theory, or they should take away the term social gospel, because there is no such thing as a social gospel that builds on hate devoid of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A question from a father to a father.
Yes, sir. Being 45 years old, having been saved less than two years ago, having four teenagers, praise God, having four teenagers in the house, the oldest of which is going to become a man or turn 18 in nine days, mm -hmm. uh, and not having had them grown up hearing this message, any words you might have to a, a father trying to navigate? I think I have time to wait to, wow. to maybe reach out to others as I mature, yeah. but I feel the clock ticking. So what have you got, 18, 18 16, 14, and 12, something like uh, that? 18, uh, soon to be 18, soon to be 17, and two twin girls who are soon to be 15. May God help you with your college bills. <laughs> When, when college tuition time comes around, uh, I'll give you my P.O. Box number. <laughs> it's uh, my word. Um, well, I'm not making light of it. I'm just uh, recognizing the intensity of what you're saying because it's a tremendous responsibility. And you know what? Even when you do know the Lord, even when you raise them right, you'll have the challenge because almost everybody goes through that period of rebellion. My son won't be embarrassed because he himself tells the story in an article he wrote when he was working for Focus on the Family of his own year and a year and a half of sojourn and struggling with his faith, you know. And uh, I remember just flying to the university where he was and just checking into a motel and writing there and seeing him at lunch and dinner and just being a friend to him during that time when he was struggling with it. We all go through that period of time, so even when you think you've done what you needed to do, that comes, and I remember on one of my birthdays, within a year or when, when, whenever he had turned things around by, by God's strength, he had a beautiful card on my pillow. He had come to celebrate my birthday. And I got to bed that night, and I opened the card, and he just said, Dearest Mom and Dad, I'm wrong, and you're right. And it was three pages of a marvelous uh, confession of the soul, and it, God turned his heart around. So sometimes some parents, even when they do what they think is right, will end up going through that valley. Many parents do. From my point of view for you, sir, I think the most important thing you're showing is that you want this to be right. That is a hunger of your soul. And I think that in itself is a wonderful thing to be affirmed. That you know that some of the years the locusts have eaten somehow have to be restored. So I would recommend to you that the best thing is not to hammer it down their throats because they themselves are watching you very carefully to see whether this change is for real or if it's just a new song being sung to them. You have to be very real, be transparent, be uh, very conceding if anything is pointed out to you, say that's right, I failed and I love you too much to watch the same thing happen to you. And if I didn't love you, it wouldn't matter, but I do love you, and I don't want you to stumble over the same walls that I stumbled at paying the price. Uh, take them to places where there's middle ground. You can't just take them to places where it's all on your ground. You have to find some middle ground so that you're reaching them where they are to bring them over one step at a time. This thing won't happen all in one big leap. The chasm may be rather huge. Make sure your life is steeped in prayer for them every day. That's the most important thing you can do for them. Pray for them, pray for them, pray for them. Love them. Even give them a long rope of tolerance because even in your own life, it's taken so long for the truth to finally sink. You don't have to celebrate the wrong, but you can try and reach them in the situation where they are. You don't have to celebrate their wrong journey, but you can still be close to them and love them. If you cut them off and you read the riot act, there will be no voice in their life that needs to be there. So walk the second mile. You know, Jesus had 12 disciples. Every one of them had a problem. Every one of them had a problem. And if you and I were selecting 12, we would have asked for a second opinion. You know, I don't think, I don't think we would have taken them. But he did. He did. And in a marvelous way, you know, when, when they asked him the question, why don't your disciples fast the way John the Baptist do? Jesus always answered an initial defusing answer and then would get to the root of it. He said, you know, you don't fast while the bridegroom is still with you. The time will come. And then he said, besides, you don't pour new wine into old wineskins. What he's really saying, if I got them to fast, they would have done it in a legalistic way and the same old miserable expression would have happened, which I've come to rescue people from. So I'm preparing the wineskin 
and then we'll pour in the new wine so that they can contain it. And his entire ministry was preparing the wine skin for the right time to pour in the wine. So your life should be preparing the wine skin of your children's hearts at the right moment. God will pour the wine in. And uh, uh, let me recommend an essay for you. It's written by F.W. Borham, B-O-R-E-H-A-M. If you can't get it, my office will kill me for this. But um, please don't everybody write, but uh, it's an essay called When the Last Cow Comes Home. And it's the story of the conversion of the Wesley family. When Susanna was on her deathbed, she had 19 children, you know, and she herself was one of 29. And uh, her last one was Hetty, her daughter, who had not come to know the Lord. And while Susanna was dying, Hetty came back and she wrote, and Bora ends by saying, the last cow had come home. So it's a beautiful essay on patience and uh, doing what is right. It's not too late. It's not too late. It's just getting on a little later in the run, but you can still run the whole race. Yep. Yes, Dr. Zacharias, um, I'm a big fan of yours. <laughs> Gotta say that, love you. Uh, and I wanted to bring up the, uh, you've said something in, in your book, you've got a chapter on the Holy Spirit. I accepted the Lord at a Bible study about 35 years ago. Within minutes after accepting him, I was led on a prayer to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And I can only say that I don't think, I had been a strong Catholic in my youth and all the way up, six kids in eight years. I know what he's going through. Uh, but it's, if I had not received that extra infilling or overfilling of the Holy Spirit, I don't think I'd have made it this far. Mm -hmm. And I, that's why I, you're a subtitle of living it. I think the only way is to throw ourselves at his feet yes. and say, live it through us, please, Lord. I appreciate that, ma'am. And actually, nobody would make it without the Holy Spirit. First of all, the new birth is engendered by him, as John chapter 3 points out to us. Then you go on two chapters later, he tells us how he gives the Holy Spirit to them that ask and you know how if a father asks a, 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 a son asks the father for a piece of stone, you know, will he, will he give him a scorpion or whatever? No, we all need the Holy Spirit. I think where I would be very careful in saying this is, I think unfortunately, again what has happened theologically is we have marked the filling of the Holy Spirit or the baptism of the Holy Spirit to be identified with a particular gift and we have lost our way in the multiplicity of gifts and the many gifts the Holy Spirit gives according to his will, not according to our design and plan. You, they that are born of the Spirit, mind the things of the Spirit. They that are born of the flesh, mind the things of the flesh. One of the clear, clearest signs of being born of the Holy Spirit is the new hungers that we have. And then the gifts of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so on. And so I would say every Christian has to be spirit-filled to walk the spirit-filled life. And I, you know, I come from a denominational tradition called the uh, Christian and Missionary Alliance. And the famed Davy Simpson always said that it had to come at a crisis experience, the so-called deeper life experience, which the Methodists often talk about, that you come to know Christ and there comes that moment in your life where you suddenly realize you want more, you want to drink deeper, you want to go. To be honest with you, I think for some, that depth has come instantly in a dramatic moment where they draw in the salvation of the Lord and the filling of the Holy Spirit. I think for others, they come to that moment of that crisis when they have backslid or whatever and start in a deeper walk. In my own life, it happened with that second crisis experience because everything was so new to me. I was 17 when I came to know the Lord on a bed of suicide, but I was 19 when I walked forward in an altar and asked the Holy Spirit to completely call me and empower me to his choosing. And I believe the gifts he gave to me were the, really the gifts of evangelism, the gift of utterance, the gift of boldness, and uh, going against my, some of my own natural inclinations has put the calling 
of uh, forth telling the truth, which I could never do in my own strength. So whatever the gift he gives, it could vary, but the source has to be the Holy Spirit of God. I don't think Spirit of God. Fair enough. No, I really don't know the background, but thanks for sharing that with me. Thank you. I try not to know too many backgrounds before I come. Yeah. <laughs> You hold it. Okay, great. Uh, every Sunday morning on our way to church, my family and I listen to you on the radio, which gives our pastor a really tough act to follow. <laughs> <laughs> my question relates to your comment about the application of evolutionary theory to morals and ethics. I recently heard Dr. Francis Collins, head of the Genome Project, um, give a wonderful testimony of his conversion, uh, uh, and, and C.S. Lewis's book was involved. And he went on to write, uh, his, his book is called The Language of God. In there he makes a strong case for common descent. And um, evolutionary theory and biology dominates the academy. And so that's obviously feeding, ap applying it in these other fields of culture, ethics, and biology, uh, and, uh, and, uh, ethic, and morality. Do you think that there's really a future in that, or is that just a, a, a trend that's going to that's going to fizzle because you you had a good response to it but it's really growing out there i yeah. wondered your feeling very fair question and first let me respond to your kind words i appreciate the hearing of the air um, um i would give the benefit of the doubt to your pastor and i'll tell you why it is this the pastor has to come back sunday after sunday after sunday and i'm sure you know this and exhort and build and teach we guys just go from place to place we can easily reuse material that we've used before. I try never to use it identically the same way. That's why I have hardly any notes. I try to bring something fresh. If I use the same old outline, I use it as a scaffolding, but I try to bring fresh truth each time. And the poor pastors have a very hard time. And uh, my whole life is committed to reading, writing, and teaching. Uh, raising a group of people steadily and nurturing them is a much harder job. And I'm, I know you know that too, but I think just to issue that disclaimer, I think one of the hardest jobs in the world right now is that of a pastor to compete against uh, so many specializations. But thank you so much for your kindness and your compliment. In terms of evolutionary theory, and um, Francis Collins, of course, has a very in interesting distinctive, and I know Francis very, very, very well, and I actually met him through Tom, and we've teamed up together. We teamed up together, Johns Hopkins, and so on, and taught. Uh, I have a difference of opinion to him on the intelligent design view. I don't know uh, exactly why he has that as a hard track to follow. And uh, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Expelled, but uh, Ben Stein makes a very strong case. And it's this to me, anytime you see intelligibility, you have to see intelligence. You never see intelligibility without intelligence behind it. Uh, the specified complexity uh, within the human DNA, I would extrapolate it into meaning that uh, a time plus matter plus chance does not produce an absolute moral law. It'll just produce an evolutionary theory of morality which can grow and change and is not anchored in any one transcendent notion of good or bad. Now, here's the point I want to make very clearly. In the Declaration of Independence, when they talk about the self-evident truth, that we are all created equal with unalienable rights. That statement alone eliminates every other world view except the Judeo-Christian worldview. The Muslim would never say that. The Hindu would never say that. For, li for liberty, for happiness and for the pursuit of happiness and so on, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness, you ask any pure Muslim theorist, as I asked the taxi driver who picked me up three days ago from Reagan. He was a professor of political science at one time in Pakistan, now he's driving a cab here with a limo company. I asked him, I said, tell me the truth. I said, I'm from India. I said, I speak the same language as you do. I said, is Islam compatible with democracy? And he looked at me and said, you know the answer to that? I said, no, but I want to hear you tell me. Since you're a political scientist, he said, no. No. It's a total control of a personal life. I'm not saying good or bad, I'm just saying it's a different worldview. Okay? So when we are created equal with unalienable rights, uh, the, the, the pantheist won't say that because the karma system brings you into a different equality, not the same equality. Now here's the question. How can we be created equal 
if we do not have essential worth. The only way that statement can stick is if we have essential worth, not conveyed worth, not secondary worth. Now, if human life has essential worth, it can only have it on a transcendent basis, not on a conveyed basis by some theory or discipline. And if it has essential worth, it has to come from a transcending notion of worth. And that, to me, is God himself. So I say, that is this, a, is this a new theory that's being bandied around that, uh, or that'll have a short lifespan? No, it is going to be a very vitriolic theory. People like Dawkins and Hitchens and Dennett and Harris have made the open commitment they are going to find a way to explain why the moral reasoning is the way that it is. And the fact of the matter, you know, you probably heard me give this before, so forgive me if it's repetition. I gave this yesterday, but I've said it many times. When the man said to God, to Jesus, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? And Jesus said to him, well, show me a coin, and said, whose image is on this coin? And he said, Caesar. He said, give to Caesar that which is Caesar, and to God that which is God's. The man ought to have said to Jesus, what belongs to God? And Jesus would have said to him, whose image is on you? It's a very obvious denotative argument. It denotes automatically the coin belongs to Caesar, Caesar's image is on that coin. And so the taxes are paid to Caesar, but God's image is on you. And if God's image is on you and you have essential worth, then the conveyor of value and worth is God, which means it is essential and you must have essential dignity with a reflective glory. Yeah. So I think, I think it will continue, but I've met so many faculty members. I was at Penn State, and I don't know how many faculty members I met there who said, you know, they really subscribe to the intelligent design theory, but many of them are nervous about even going public, lest they lose their position, and lest they be evicted in the process. There are numerous people on the faculties of various universities who actually are very covert transcendentalists but they do not know how to come right out in the open and admit it. And so this will remain for some time, but it will never evict God from the arena. God has a sense of humor. He rises up to outlive his pallbearers. <laughs> this will need to be our last question. It's uh, 9.35, we'll go till 9.40. Um, Sorry, tomorrow, we'll have a chance tomorrow, too. I'm tomorrow sorry. you'll have another yeah. chance. Okay. Um, you talked about the depravity of the heart. I was just wondering how that works with what God promised about the new covenant in Ezekiel and Jeremiah about taking their stone of heart of stone and replacing it with a stone of flesh and mm -hmm. writing his laws upon our heart. I was wondering if you could clarify that. Yeah, absolutely. It's a case of before and after. You know, I think the human heart is depraved and lost and uh, out, of, out of fellowship with God. But I believe when that transformation comes through the Holy Spirit, it's, uh, it's a little bit like this. When you're born of the flesh, you reflect the things of the flesh. You reflect the human DNA. And I think that's why it is amazing what Jesus said, except a man be born again. Uh, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It's a new birth that gives a new way of thinking and a new paradigm. I can tell you story after story of what I've seen. Let me just give you this one. I remember speaking at the Geo Center for Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow. My wife was with me and one of my colleagues. I was there for three hours and I was on the hot, on the hot seat. They threw question after question at me so hostile. In fact, I thought to myself, what on earth am I even doing here? Why am I here? They were all in their uniforms, metal flashing on their ample chests, you know. And I was sitting there taking all this kind of stuff in and I don't know what happened, but somewhere in the two thirds of the conversation, this was actually in a very huge hall, high ceilings, and uh, very much uh, a, a Russian motif. And uh, at the end of that, I started, I sensed a turn. I'd shared my testimony with them and asked them a few questions that I wanted them to answer about their own history. Something happened, I don't know what. 
There was a turn in the mood. My wife says that, my colleague said that, something happened. It's almost as the God came and took over in that conversation and made it more than just a theoretical one. And after it was over, they had lined up to say goodbye. They had become very quiet by this point and very kind. And one by one, they took my wife's hand and kissed her and thanked her for coming. And then they were shaking hands with me and the chairman of the department who was hosting the meeting held my hand and he said, Mr. Zacharias, thank you for coming here. He said, I believe what you have told us about God today is the truth. But it's very difficult to change after 70 years of believing a lie. The general who had invited me there was the chief historian. He's got to meet my son now, Nathan. And uh, I had taken him aside and told him a few stories from Lenin's history and so on that brought tears to his eyes. And after one meeting in one occasion, I remember his name is General Kirshen. I was standing one-on-one -on -one in front of the auditorium. The room was all emptied. And I challenged him with the message of Jesus Christ. I said, you're in your senior years. I said, your leader, once upon a time, believed in God. And then he renounced God and became an atheist. And he was in a seminary at one stage, preparing for a seminary priesthood. Then he renounced God and he killed 15 million of your people because he believed if you torture people, they will follow you for food the rest of their lives. I said, you have an option to either believe that kind of stuff or you can turn to Jesus Christ who says he loves you and wants to give you everlasting life because you're a creature of value to him and he can change everything in your heart and cause you to become a new person. Right in front of that auditorium, General Kirshen bowed his head and prayed with me to receive Christ. The incredible transformation, I can tell you, he was almost like a father to me after that. And my father was a torturous man. He bullied me. Even in my teens, the beatings I took were merciless. Saw him beat my mom. I've told the story in the book, Walking from East to West. If he were here today, he'd be telling it to you in more crass terms than I am. The day he fall, the day he gave his life to Jesus Christ, he stumbled at a church in Toronto and walked forward and fell on his face at the altar. My dad was a very proud man. He was a big, powerful man in India. He gave his life to Christ. He, my mother died in 1974. She was only in her 50s. My dad came to Christ and my dad and mom came to Christ in 1968. In six years, I never saw him lose his temper once with my mom. I never saw even a shadow of what he used to be. And when my mother died, my wife will tell you, he stood by her coffin and he said, Belle, can you ever forgive me for all the years in which I ill-treated you? My wife, looking at a photograph album, said, by looking at your dad's pictures, I can tell you when he became a Christian. The transformation is complete. We may not all be as bad as the other, but we're all as badly off. And we need that Christ's love to change us. So that change is a definite one. And if you've not sensed that change, then maybe you get back to your room tonight, anyone, get on your knees and say, Lord, I need that power to become a new person. Without you, I'm never gonna make it. And when you sense that new hunger, you will know he's visited you and he will put that mark in your soul that you're a new creature. It may be slow sometimes, Maybe slow, but it can be real. God bless you, and thanks so much for being patient. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.